Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So we are going to get started. Um, first, uh, first off, my name is Andre Holder. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the session. And uh, for those of you who um, may be in the wrong place, this is the called the prediction game. Uh, so we're looking at uh, uses of AI in critical care. Um, now, uh, before we begin, I just want to mention a couple of housekeeping things. Unfortunately, two of our, spe of our three speakers uh, uh, had family or personal emergencies that precluded them from coming. Um, no worries, we still have three speakers, but uh, because of that, the themes may be a little bit off, um, but I think we're still in for a treat, though. So uh, uh, first up, I'm actually going to start this process off. Um, again, you'll forgive my slides because this was not originally intended for SCCM. Uh, but uh, I will be talking about uh, playing the game. So potentials for machine learning and artificial intelligence and critical illness prediction. Uh, so first off, um, I have some funding uh, from, uh, in order to, to create machine learning based prediction algorithms for sepsis. Um, however, any of the the uh, companies or devices that I mentioned, I do not get uh, any reimbursement or funding to promote them. They are simply mentioned in the purpose of science. So um, my objectives here are threefold. So I'm going to first off discuss the differences between AI and machine learning. Uh, we'll summarize some the current and future landscape of uh, or what I think may be the future landscape of AI and machine based uh, prediction and critical illness. And um, I'll provide some, some suggestions for how we can better deploy these things uh, to try to maximize clinical benefit. Um, I, I realize that some of these, the things that I'll mention uh, have been discussed in other sessions. Um, so I'll try, I will highlight the things that I think um, uh, are unique to my presentation. So first off, um, we'll start off with what is artificial intelligence. So it is has been defined as simulating intelligent behavior by machines. So the next question is, what is intelligence? And Wikipedia defines it as the ability to apply knowledge and the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Now, um, for those of you who may or may not have read this paper, I would strongly recommend reading this by Ledley. It uh, came out um, probably over 60 years now. Um, and it was a really, really interesting paper because it broke down, first off, they talked about use of computers um, to emulate physicians and how we diagnose and how we treat people. And uh, they basically broke it down mathematically in terms of our process of how we do things. So first off, there are, we, we use observations, right? And these are absolutes. So if it's raining outside, I will carry an umbrella. So there is some kind of logic built into that. Um, in terms of, so then we move on to other things though that make us intelligent. So things like experience, right? Now this is not absolutes. These are, this is now where, where we're incorporating probability. So we have some set of experiences that informs our, what we think our risk is of some person having some disease process or their likelihood of responding to a particular treatment. So, um, I will add in some commentary here that we're probably, with respect to AI, um, somewhere in this space now, at least in terms of the research. Now, there's a, an additional piece, though, that we as clinicians do where um, I think that we're not quite there yet, and that's adding the value. So this is also a probability estimate, but now we're talking about things like what are the, what's the value in, what are our patients' value in terms of what they would like, right? So. This has to do with things like goals of care. Um, do they really want to get this, ca this cardiac cath if they're 85, have dementia, and probably don't have a good quality of life or a good life expectancy? So now, what is machine learning? Um, so this is where we talk about that experience piece, if you recall in the prior slide. So what is experience? So first off, um, Arthur Samuels, uh, back in the late 1950s, defined uh, machine learning as the ability of computers to learn without being explicitly programmed. Fast forward a few years, um, and Tom Mitchell from Carnegie Mellon um, defined it a little bit differently, and I, I actually like this a bit more. Um, so it's the ability of computers to learn 
from experience with respect to some task and has some performance metric that we, that we look at to see how well it's doing. So the experience here um, is the data set that we're looking at. The task is whatever it is that we want it to predict or do. And the performance metric is whatever you decide is most appropriate to determine how well it's doing. So the sort of common um, things that machine learning algorithms have already done really well is, for instance, playing games. Um, the gaming industry is really big in this right now. Um, simple things, though, like checkers. Now, if you translate that to um, what we talk about, um, that also includes things like regression. But I would, I would submit that the biggest difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence is this iterative process. So, th so machine learning essentially is needed for these computers to become more intelligent and behave more like us. The analogy I use is uh, to dis explain this difference. So think about this a thought experiment. You have a five-year-old or a 10-year-old who learns how to type on a typewriter in the 1970s. Um, and then in 2020, they're still typing on a typewriter, right? So they have no idea how to work this. So this is analogous to feeding, a data, feeding a, an algorithm some kind of data set that's 50 years old. Um, obviously, it needs to learn more about things that have happened in the interim in order to be more informative about patients that it's seeing now. So again, just to summarize here the difference, AI is, if AI is the toolbox, machine learning is the most, one of the more powerful tools in that toolbox. And think of statistics as, um, as almost like the, the, the drive, the, 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 the power behind that. I'm not going to belabor this issue, but there are different categories of machine learning algorithms. Um, these, this is representative of supervised learning, where you give it some kind of output or some kind of label that it's, used, that it's trying to learn off, it's trying to learn to predict, and you give it some data. There's the unsupervised approach, the most common of which is cluster algorithms, which is basically made used for phenotyping, at least in our context. And then um, the particularly hot topic uh, in the past couple years has been uh, using deep learning or, or neural networks um, to learn. So I think the thing I really want to focus on, though, is who's playing the game right now? Because I think that's actually going to inform how we implement this and how we deploy it in the future. So many people, depending on what your, your concept of or your, what your impression is of what artificial intelligence is, um, if you recall, I also mentioned that intelligence can be defined by observations. That's a part of what we do. Um, so really, many of our current um, uh, alerts that we use in our electronic medical records can be considered artificial intelligence on some very basic level. So things like medication alerts, interactions that we get pop-ups for, um, glycemic control, I'm going to hi highlight that a little bit later, uh, some of the sepsis screening tools that are built into our electronic medical records, all can be considered some form of artificial intelligence. Now, what about machine learning? Where is that being used today? Well, not a lot of places. Right? So there's pretty much a dearth of it. Now, I will say, though, that that is going to radically change, um, especially as we enter this new decade. So um, I'm going to highlight one case study right now, um, looking at uh, Glucomander. And that device is actually interesting because so it's, it's mainly targeted at glycemic control. Um, it's used in both the inpatient and the outpatient setting, and it's targeted for that as well. But I'm going to highlight its use in the ICU. So uh, we use this system at my shop, and um, the whole idea of Glucomander is that you have a suite or of modules that you can select from to do various things related to glycemic control at your institution. So the first of this is the SmartClick device. Um, so this is meant to be e used to, meant to be as a means of EMR integration. So you can best find the patients that can benefit from your your uh, glycemic control device. Glucose surveillance is a, is a platform built on top of that that helps handle that as well. Actually, let me back up. SmartClick is more so uh, for data integration. So it's automated feedback of the data that it receives back to the EMR. Glucose, glucose surveillance 
is what identifies patients who may be at risk for, uh, or who may, mean, who may need better glycemic control. Um, gluco Glucometrics is their analytics set that can be used as a QI tool. And then the glycoud is where all that processing happens. So it is a modified closed loop system, um, and meaning that there is still a human in this chain. And um, they use basically a linear regression. But this modifier that, that is used to identify what the insulin dose is that the patient should have progressively changes based on where they are with respect to your target. So this is what the dashboard looks like. Um, so this is the list of patients that are currently in the unit. These are two patients who are currently active on Glucomander. And looking at one patient in particular, um, this is a trend of what their blood glucoses look like. That green band is, your, is the, the place in which you want your glucose to be um, optimized. There have been studies that look at this, and uh, they've shown some benefit with respect to glucose control. Um, the mean dose of glucose, of uh, the mean uh, blood glucose levels over time was lower in the glucomander group compared to the standard control arm, which was a paper-based uh, form of glycemic control. Patients reached uh, glycemic control earlier, about half the time, from four hours, from nine hours to four hours. Um, and there were, more importantly, there were less episodes of hypoglycemia. So patients who had blood glucoses less than 40 uh, went from about 70% down to about 30%. So was, how, why was it effective? Why is it effective as its goal? First off, it's a simple metric. So all you're looking at as your target is glycemic control, blood glucose, that's it. It's very objective in measurement. There's no black box, right? I mean, all of you saw what that linear regression model looked like. Um, it can be flexibly, it can be applied, um, uh, it's flexible in its local application. So as I mentioned, there are modules. Um, for instance, our shop, does not use the EMR um, interface, in large part because I deal with a patient population uh, where um, compliance with our dietary asks of them is variable. And if, if Glucomander gets information about someone who just ate when, they, when it's saying it wasn't, they weren't supposed to, their blood glucose now shoot, shoots up to 330, well, Glucomander doesn't know the difference whether or not that's just them having poor glycemic control or if they ate. So it'll actually f keep giving them, um, or you'll, op you'll be operating off of information that's not, not accurate. So you still need, so we at our shop still have someone manually entering that data, um, as well as manually selecting patients that are most appropriate for it. It may actually improve workflow and um, better compliance um, and potentially decrease blood glucose checks if it's in its target range. So it's flexible in terms of how frequently it asks you to measure it. Um, there's also end user buy-in. People, have, nurses have noticed that their patients' blood glucoses are, are, are uh, responding quicker than they used to when they were on the paper chart. So again, there's that buy-in. One honorable mention is the Hero device. Uh, so this is actually based off of Randall Mormon's, uh, if you're familiar with Randall Mormon's work in neonates. Um, he used a heart rate uh, variability metric to predict sepsis um, and found that when he studied this in about 3,000 patients, uh, there was a 2% decrease in, in absolute, 2% um, in de decrease in mortality. So this device is actually commercialized and um, I believe is, is FDA cleared. So Looking into the future, again, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because I know that you've seen these in other talks. Um, so there's certainly a lot of potential in where we can use uh, this kind of technology, particularly AI and machine learning. So mortality is certainly one thing that has been used, um, and I'll refer you to Matthew Chirpek's papers. Clinical decompensation is another. Um, there's a lot of rapid response data that's coming out now. In terms of prediction of sepsis, um, this is work from a former, former colleague of mine, Shamim Namadi, uh, where, where he designed a, a, um, a, basically a, a, an algorithm surround, around survival analysis and was able to predict, accurately predict, those who would develop sepsis um, with an AUC of 0.8 and the, the, at a, specific, a sensitivity of 85%, the specificity was somewhere around 70%. And that is independent of how far out from four hours to 12 hours from uh, time of prediction. Um, 
as well as how you define sepsis. AKI, again, I'll, I'm sure many of you have already seen the Nature paper that came out uh, last year looking at um, AKI prediction and the fact that they were able to, to accurately identify it 90% of the time, particularly in those who required renal replacement therapy. In acute respiratory failure, this is another area. Um, extubation success, delirium, the list goes on and on. Um, I'm going to move past these. So f looking particularly now at machine learning, uh, there are other potential opportunities for it. So physiologic waveform processing and analysis, I know this is a hot topic, many have, many have covered this elsewhere. Um, biomarker discovery and omics methods. So efficient data synthesis or learning electronic medical records. Many might not think about this as a predictive analytic tool, but here the prediction is us. So um, there's certainly, there's literature out there to suggest that these models can actually identify what you're looking at in the electronic medical record and send you back information that's similar to what you're looking at, what it knows that you look at most frequently because it learns your practice patterns and how you look at the data. Image processing, again, is another area. So looking at you know, various metrics for, uh, in the ECG and other waveforms. And then also unstructured data analyses. So uh, this uh, is a device called the Insight System. Um, and again, this is another AI device that's sort of on the horizon. Um, what they did is look at a minimal data set of um, what are called extended vitals. So age plus a bunch of different vital signs, including G uh, GCS. Um, in a retrospective study of 20,000 or so patients, um, they had fairly good performance. And they even did a sensitivity analysis with missingness, um, random missingness, which is very important to note, which is something that we, may, we probably don't see as much. Um, but still, when they looked at this and, tried, and did a small RCT, they saw a 20% uh, reduction in the length of stay in those who they targeted this device to predict sepsis um, from 13 days to 10 days. There was a 58% reduction in their mortality uh, from about 21% to 9%. And then they decreased the time to antibiotics to, by about three hours. Um, there were some differences in the control versus the experimental arm. Um, by the way, sepsis here was defined by ICD-10 code. Um, but uh, yet and still, this shows promise. Um, one thing I will say in terms of things to look out for, uh, we still need to identify certain potential limitations in the things that we look at and try to predict. Um, the first off is looking at the, um, the, the infrastructure that we have to try to implement this in real time. Um, the, so retrospective data and looking at, the, at this retrospectively is very different from trying to implement this in real time. The other thing that we need to pay attention to is the actual data that we're using to train these algorithms. Um, the data is, the algorithm is limited by the data that you present to it. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, and also probably the hardest thing to do is how do, we, how do we optimize this for the end user? The people who are going to be using these algorithms, these predictive algorithms uh, in the future, we need to meet their needs. Now, despite those things, first off, I'm going to leave many of the potential limitations to our, our next speaker. Um, who will talk about it more from, a, uh, from a, a consumer perspective and also from a person who's reading these, these articles. But um, I am a glass half full kind of person, so I do believe that, that there is opportunity um, if we do this in, in the right way. First off, planning. So what is our problem and what is the infrastructure that we have to address it? Um, these, are, these can be very complex things that we're trying to predict. We need to start small. Again, back at the level of Glucomander, what is a simple target that we can look at? Look, once we master that, then we can move on to the bigger things like sepsis. Communication, who's going to be, what is our, again, what is our, our target outcome? These algorithms need to be flexible in how they're deployed, simple, sim sim similar to the way that Glucomander was. Um, knowing what the local culture is and adopting to that. It needs to be interpretable. People aren't going to use what they don't trust. It needs to be actionable. So again, looking at that outcome that you're looking at. Um, and if it's actionable at your local level, Matt Chirpek talked about this uh, yesterday in his talk. And then we need to engage the end users so that again, we know that we're meeting their needs.
So to summarize, machine learning is a tool with which one can obtain, uh, which one can obtain AI using statistics. We're already exposed to predictive analytics uh, in critical care practice at this point in time, and that will only grow. There are many complex challenges, but again, I'm an optimist, and I do see opportunity as long as we uh, implement these things and learn from uh, the simpler tools that we have available and grow from there. And with that, uh, I thank you. So I ran over my own time. <laughs> so uh, I'll take uh, a question uh, from the audience if there is any. All right, seeing none, I guess we'll move on to the next speaker. So uh, Dr. Sujin Park is in, is, uh, in neurocritical care at Columbia University, um, and she will talk about the limitations to approaches in clinical prediction. Thank you. Uh, so I'm the one person who didn't call out, and yet I have a cough, but I struggled through it, and I'm here. So now you have to struggle through that, so I apologize in advance. Um, so I was asked by Andre, I have um, just, uh, I have no financial disclosures, I'm not beholden to any industry, um, I'm supported by the NIH Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. Um, so I was asked to talk um, today to introduce kind of themes about limitations of um, machine learning so that audience um, generally was thought to be consumers or critical readers of the literature. Um, you know, neurocritical care um, is spawning a, a, a number of people interested in data science and machine learning in particular, not yet AI per se, because we're a little bit far from implementation. Um, but it's a very data-rich environment where our patients are frequently in a coma, either induced or from their first primary brain injury, but they are there for the purpose of preventing secondary brain injury, and we often don't have external signs of knowing when that's about to happen. Um, so we have a lot of data, and we have such a great opportunity to try to integrate some of the methods from data science to, to build information and then ultimately knowledge. Um, our goals in neurocritical care are very much like in general ICU, other types of specialty ICUs. Um, it multiple fold that we can do with this data potentially. We're trying to identify in real time secondary brain injury events as they are happening so that we may intervene in time to salvage any secondary brain injury or, or um, salvageable brain. Um, we use monitors, um, uh, intracranial and extracranial, to understand when our aggressive measures are, um, should be limited, and also we try to use our data um, to prognosticate better when to pull back some of our care. Uh, Evidence-based medicine is, you know, um, uh, you, you, have a, you have a hypothesis, you collect data through a study, you analyze it, and you can make a claim about um, some uh, basic mechanism or even for, for a claim about uh, causal, causal inference. Um, data science or, or big data approaches come from more of a computational tradition, which is very, which is based on raw data observations. It's much more data driven. It does not build in any kind of understanding or um, nuance about context, so no contextual information. And so from a data set, you can very confidently find patterns, and yet you can't understand which of the findings are true, which are spurious, and which ones are um, it, you know, enhanced by bias. And so machine learning can't cure that, but the users of it can. And as critical readers and users of this literature, I think it's important to feel that it's an attainable goal, because most clinicians in modern day are pretty adept at reading sort of evidence-based medicine and understanding enough statistics to say, I mean, what's the purpose of reading these journals, is to try to say, how can I bring best information into my patient care now? How can I read this to try to glean from it? What can I do today? And so I, I would posit that it's very possible to attain that very basic level of understanding. So my goal today is just to kind of go through some of those themes of what to think about and to seek more knowledge if you're interested in when you're reading these types of, of literature. Machine learning, d uh, deep learning, these terms seem to be everywhere, right? And Google searches, it's sort of upticked in the mid-2000s. Um, and that's certainly happening in, in, in healthcare. Um, 
you know, from an author perspective, it's very, it's more the, the rarity where you have one individual who's an expert domain in both the clinical part as well as the methods. There are certainly some really amazing individuals who have a PhD in physics or computer science or math and also are MDs and do critical care. And um, those are some of the leaders in this, in this field. Um, but I would say the majority of people who are working in this space, such as myself, are more expert in one field and are becoming better in the other, in the other domain, and vice versa. Our partners in this team science are expert in methodology, and they embed themselves with us to really understand the healthcare perspective so that they're answering clinically actionable questions, and they're putting, they're inspired to do good and use these methods, but they don't quite understand what is a question that can spend years on that a person can do just as easily. It's not really useful to have a, a fancy algorithm, as I like to say. From a reviewer perspective, um, a challenge for sending these types of manuscripts out for review is the same audience who are reviewers are the same audience who are the doers and so and the readers. Um, very minority of people are expert in both, and so frequently you will have reviewers who don't feel confident or feel intimidated by the methods and sort of pass it through and say, it sounds like clinically this is a good idea. And you might have another reviewer who says, you know, the methods seem fine, but I have no idea what to do to say about the clinical aspect. And so it presents a really interesting challenge, one that we're, you know, a, a, most of critical care journals are dealing with now. Um, but, you know, we depend on the people in the audience who are here for the purposes of learning this um, to be more informed reviewers and then readers, of course. It, you know, the impact of these journals only hinges on your ability to be critical of what you're reading and also understanding the limitations and the applicability to your practice. So a very common question that comes up about big data is how much data is enough? How big is that? So it, there's a, a very frustratingly vague response that you will hear all the time, which is it, it depends. There actually is no like set number that you can really say the question. It depends on actually the model that you end up choosing to use. Um, you can look for similar studies that have been done either in that domain or with that method to try to understand knowing the limitations of both, the need for a very representative database for data set, for example, on that data side. And so you can look for similar studies if they have been done. Um, clinical knowledge here could be very useful. So is a sa sample that you're working with representative for what, you're, what you think is the problem that you're, you're trying to answer? Um, and are the examples independent? Um, and identically distributed. And then you can use um, statistical heuristics for trying to understand how much data is enough, and that is, you can think about how many classes am I talking about? Is it sepsis or not sepsis, just two classes? What are your input features? So what are the things about the patient, the variables like heart rate? Is it heart rate variability? Is it seven measures of heart rate variability? Are there 12? Are there nonlinear var variables? And, um, and finally, uh, where am I? Right. Um, and then your model parameters, of course. And so then if you have nonlinear algorithms, they might need much more data, and that's sort of generally accepted. Um, and we know that with nonlinear algorithms, they just get better with more data. So the more raw data observations you have, the better and more reliable your, general, uh, your, your pattern detection uh, will be. Um, oh, and I can't go back, can I? Uh, but lastly, you want to see when you're reading this that some method was, uh, was attempted by the authors to determine what is the right sample size. Do they address these kinds of questions and explain it to you as a reader? And do they do some methods to try to prove to themselves and also to you or upon inquiry that they did like a learning curve to see that this was an optimal uh, data set to answer the question using the model that they chose? So. Um, when it comes to size of data, they talk about n as a sample size, like little n, um, and big n, and little p, and big p. So here, n means number of patients, and p means the number of parameters, the number of features about a patient that you're putting into your model. So in general, uh, in a little n is like less than 1,000, in general, because I'm going to be very vague from frustratingly so. And the big n tends to be greater than 1,000. Little p tends to be in about the hundreds. Um, depends on the model, and a big P tends to be greater than that. Um, and so and a little n, little p might be your case report, right? One sample size, maybe a couple of factors that you're describing, but a case report with infinite genomic data might be an n with a big P, 
Um, you're, a lot of the data sets that we might have, there are less than a thousand, but that have, you know, a couple of hundred um, parameters that you're interested in. To us, seems like a very large and rich data set, and it is, certainly. And certainly a lot of the um, data science results are coming from studies like that. But more generally, you're looking at these other, the big and little p, big little and big P, uh, a lot of those. So and I'll give you some examples of that. But the ideal, obviously, is big N, big P. So some examples in neurocritical care that we have of data sets that um, achieve some of these big data marks are the impact database. A lot, a lot of patients, but not that much information about each of those patients. A couple of imaging data, but nothing like physiologic data or things like this. The brain IT database is another one that's really well known. Um, this has a lot of data about a single patient, but there are only 200 patients in this data set, and yet that could be considered um, especially in critical care with like the physiologic monitoring, EEG data, imaging data, genomic data, all the omics. If you have omics involved, that's a big P. Um, Center TBI is a really cool um, pan-European study that's kind of coming to a close now. And they're one that has reached this ideal. They have 1,800 ICU pa neuro ICU patients in, in traumatic brain injury. And they have all the data. They have all the things. They have physiologic data. They have outcome data. They have blood. They have CSF. They have, they have it all. And so it's, it, you know, you're, you're going to see in the next, you're already starting to see a lot of publications from this. It's really going to teach us a lot about pattern detection and TBI and optimal management. Um, um, approaches. And so, as I mentioned, the institutional database do approach the N, little n, big P, and even the big N, big P, um, but they're not generally publicly available. And so, that poses a sort of a hurdle, um, specifically neurocritical care, I'm talking, for some of these kinds of studies to be done. Um, you know, you have a single center with that kind of data, only the single center gets to be able to use it rather than opening it up to many, many different data scientists and teams who might be able to data mine that set. So, so data sharing and privacy, this is, a, this is a big issue, especially for if you're trying to get to that big N, um, and even the big P, um, you need anonymized data in the US, you need permissions from patients to access that data, and you need to harmonize it. The data all has to be kind of the same if you're coming from multiple centers. And because um, only a, a couple of places have been able to overcome these types of hurdles, like for example, in China, that's a very large population, or a fewer restrictions on um, sharing digital data. And so the opportunities for companies and researchers to really data mine that type of data is so is, is a much lower threshold, and they're going to make a lot more advances. Kaiser Permanente obviously has so many millions of patients in a single center, same data set. They're really ahead of the curve on informatics and trying to use this data, uh, this type of data. Um, they have an actual newborn sepsis risk calculator that is in use right now. It's been validated on over 200,000 perinatal admissions. Um, Philips EICU, they have a, you know, it's kind of a, you know, a captive audience. You have millions of patients' data of ICU, the same kind. The MIMIC-3 is a really impressive um, innovation um, that has proven to be such a resource for teams of data scientists and physicians to uh, mine this data for, for really, for gold. And then United Health, which is um, probably the largest um, insurer uh, in our country, has probably actually like 200 million members, and they have a health services research arm um, that can overcome this hurdle about patient privacy anonymous. They own this data. But because the rest of us have to rely on working with others and building the big N and build, building the big P, um, unfortunately, and I'm speaking for neurocritical care, but I think this exists to some degree in all um, critical care units, um, there are different modalities that are used across centers, and especially for modalities that are maybe not super standard, maybe they're only available um, at certain types of centers. Um, the indications for when you might place a monitor or when you might uh, have an intervention might vary from place to place, um, when you would image somebody, um, how you measure things. So do you measure your arterial blood pressure at the tragus for neurocritical care, which would be you know, the starling resistors in the head, but most like half the places will measure it at the phlebostatic axis, and so you have a measurement difference with a 30 degree head of bed up that is not accounted for a lot in the storage of the data. There's no data dictionary usually that tells you when did the protocol change, did it change for this patient, et cetera. Um, and then practice variability. So for neurocritical care, we have extraventricular drains that can give you ICP waveforms when that um, fluid filmanometer is clamped shut and is a closed system, and you have 
continuous ICP measurement, but in the majority of cases, you have it left open and only clamped intermittently, and so you only have ICP waveforms for short periods of time. And then you have a different compliance system when you've let it be draining in between these clamping trials. Um, so there are a lot of uh, opportunities for the lack of standardization to introduce a lot of systematic biases in your data that if you don't note it in the, in the methods section, then a reader or a reviewer um, can't understand what kinds of systematic biases might influence your outcome in your study. Another aspect of, of data sort of munging or data cleaning that are, are, in, are important for a reader to understand is how is the labeling or the labeling of your output designated. So this is a machine. You have inputs, which are your features. So a feature is really like a variable is like a heart rate. A feature would be like mean heart rate, right? So something you did to the variable is now a feature. You can have infinite numbers of how you might look at that variable. So you have an input, you put it into a model, you have many, many inputs, you put it into a model, then you have an output. And your output is, what are you trying to predict? If it's a classifier, I'm going to classify for sepsis or not sepsis. Um, and so in, in these critical care data sets are mostly retrospective and they're clinically generated. So all the labels that you're saying for sepsis are clinically generated. And we know in a clinical scenario, we're not putting into our EMR, this patient has sepsis as of 10 minutes ago for the purposes of future research. That's not how it goes. It's usually rule out sepsis, right? Or you send a lactate and cultures and might start some empiric antibiotics. You might give some fluids, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a lot of stuff you're doing before you might have that gold standard or you know, ground truth of a patient has this label or not. And so when you're trying to use labels in critical care um, uh, for model building and model testing and validation, we often find that we need to clean the data a bit by having trained clinicians annotate, go back and annotate the data if it's a small enough N. Um, and then if you, if it's too much, if it's too big of an N, then you might have to validate some kind of a EHR proxy. So whether that's a coding or a billing or a lab or something else that you've decided is a proxy for your gold, your ground truth outcome. Um, and then of course you need to validate that. And so these are things to look for. And the most interesting way, I think, is you know, specifically in things like sepsis or vasospasm, which is the uh, syndrome that I'm most interested in, is it's a problem that has an insidious onset. Um, that is, the label depends actually on your clinical suspicions. So if you don't suspect it, you're not going to send the test that's going to confirm it at some point in the future. And both of those types of things are insidious onset. You, need, you know that time to treatment is very important. So you're going to intervene. You're going to do things to the patient and influence their physiology. And let's say that you're using blood pressure or heart rate or something like this or volume status as a input, but you have an intervention that predates your ground truth of your, of your label that's actually impacting your heart rate and your blood pressure and your volume status. Now, if you're using all of that information to then predict your output, you're actually um, using a model to detect when your physician decided the patient had sepsis, not when the patient had sepsis or not. Okay. And so this is called causality leakage. And this is more important in terms of you have to have a data set that includes your label, but your, you have to censor your input data before, well before you think it's going to be influenced by your outcome of interest. And so talking about bias, there's so many ways data can be biased, but these are some of the more um, obvious ones that I think we need to be aware of as sort of cursory or, or intelligent readers of this kind of, infor of, of, of research. So missing data. So we measure lots of things. Things have artifact. Things are disconnected. And so you might have a lot of heart rate, but you might not have any blood pressure for like an hour or two hours, whatever. What do you do with that missing data? And those decisions that you make will introduce systematic bias into your data. It absolutely will. You cannot avoid it, and machine learning cannot fix it, but the user and the, um, the user and the applicator of the machine learning tool must think about these things. And so you can make some choices. You can say, I'm going to get rid of all the heart rate where there was no blood pressure. There was this much blood pressure missing to throw out that patient. Well, these are systematic biases that you're introducing, and some ones are more impactful than others, like getting rid of a patient, obviously. That's a huge bias. And so another method is to impute the data, to just fill it in with reasonable substitutions. Um, and there are better ones and less better ones. Um, again, mention the retrospective data. So you want to understand what are the selection bias of the patients who are in your data set? How might that inf influence your associations that you're making? 
optimization choices. This has to do more with your machine learning model and your, your hypothesis testing, if you will, of your machine learning model. There is a phase of how you're choosing to choose those parameters and those features. How are you choosing to um, provide constraints? You have this infinite space of where you're mapping the, the differences between two classes, and where do you start looking? So you can have a model that runs for a year, or if you want to try to do it, okay. Um, and then <clears throat> being told to move on. I do want to touch on the worst kind of bias that there possibly can be is the social bias. And so if you have a systematic structural inequality, for this example, this is actually the United Health one that I was saying before. So if you have the structural bias that in our society says that black people are getting less care for a similar or more severe illness, then the cost of that care for that sick patient, sicker patient, is going to be less. And if you use cost as a input for predicting outcome or somebody who's sick enough to deserve or warrant some intervention, then you are actually steering a model in use away from a sicker patient based on race. And so it's so important to understand how you're choosing your labels, validate those uh, labels, do extensive testing on subgroups to see which subgroups of interest who are most vulnerable are, are being hurt and then understand what is the bias that's been introduced from your data, for example. Um, I just want to make a note that United Health is fixing that, and it's really interesting. And then finally, validation. So validation is super important. How are you splitting your data? You should have, uh, you, you train, you learn that from the data, you have a, a training set and a testing set. You see how it's performing. It's a good model. I've changed a few things. I've tweaked it. Now I have a final model. And then you have a holdout set that's not in the hypothesis generation stage, and you test it and make sure that it's working. And it's even better if that test set is not in your institution. So this is all generalizability stuff, but I am done with my time. These are my take home points. Uh, look for assumptions, management of missing data. These are all in the methods, Proper, um, properties of the models. How do, they, how, how do they optimize their model? That's tuning the parameters, things like that, the constraints. And what are the expected weaknesses? They should tell you why they chose that model and what they expect this to be good at or bad at. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sujin. So uh, next up and last up is uh, Dr. Robert Stevens. By the way, uh, if there are any questions for this presentation, we'll save those till the end just to keep, keep up with our time. Uh, so Dr. Robert Stevens is in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine and Department of Urology, Neurosurgery, and Radiology. He is a professor in those capacities, uh, also in the Institute of Computational Medicine uh, at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Stevens. So as I um, reflect on the title of this session, um, Intelligent Uses of Artificial Intelligence, um, the Prediction Game, it's, it's actually the title that I wrote. Uh, and I'm feeling kind of bad because I think it's wrong on multiple counts uh, because um, artificial intelligence is not as intelligent as we think it is. And I don't think we've found by any stretch intelligent ways of using AI. And I don't think this is a game either because we're talking about medicine and intensive care medicine and the lives of our patients. So anyway, the next time I'll try to do better. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the use of machine learning in the realm of EEG. This is a field that's uh, developing rapidly. We have some research that's going on at Johns Hopkins, but most of the research that I'm presenting you was done elsewhere. So what are some of the challenges in the neurological intensive care unit? So one of them is that the brain is so incredibly complex, right? Um, you know, we were talking with Dr. Park earlier about the N's and the P's. So the brain is an instance where the P's are much greater than the N's, right? So if we talk about, for example, individual neurons, we've got, you know, many millions of neurons, but the possible uh, realm of interactions between those different neurons or neuronal groups far exceeds the number of neurons. So it's a high dimensional system by definition. And it turns out that machine learning uh, is probably the best way, the best technology that we have to leverage high dimensional systems. So another issue is that the neural code, so the, the relationship between you know, events in the brain and specific parts in the brain uh, and behaviors that we see phenotypically is really not solved. You know, this is one of the fundamental problems in, in, in neuroscience is that we don't really, we haven't developed a clear mapping between neural events and behaviors and, uh, and, and um, cognitive events. And so there's a lot that needs to be done there. Another issue is that the, ish, the illnesses that we see in the intensive care unit 
um, such as stroke, TBI, are just like sepsis or ARDS, are incredibly heterogeneous. Um, and lastly, overall, even though we do a lot of great things in the neurological intensive care unit, we failed on many counts, right? So we, we're not so good at uh, detection. There's many diseases, for example, vasospasm or del delayed cerebral ischemia. Um, you know, our, our approach is often extremely passive. We just wait for it to happen and then we intervene. Uh, we're not terribly good at predicting outcomes in a range of neurological disorders. And we really haven't developed any disease-specific, biologically targeted therapies. So just like cancer is moving ahead by leaps and bounds in terms of precision medicine, we're a long way from precision medicine in the neuro, neuro ICU. But this is what we're working on. So I, I think one of the things that I would like to propose is that maybe through data science, we can arrive at some solutions to these seemingly daunting problems. When we talk about data science, we're really talking about this convergent discipline that includes, you know, of course, computer science expertise, uh, expertise in statistics and mathematics, and of course, domain expertise. That means the inputs from people like myself or like you guys, people who are clinicians who work in the ICU who know about the biology, the pathophysiology, uh, and uh, the clinical presentations. So when we think about sources of data to make inferences on brain function and dysfunction, you know, we can, one way to present this is to think of uh, spatial uh, resolution and temporal resolution. And we know that imaging techniques that I spoke about this morning, like MRI, have extremely high spatial resolution and can provide a, you know, a huge amount of detail, not only on you know, functional, uh, more of structural changes, but also functional alterations in the, in the injured brain. Uh, but the temporal resolution of you know, MRI, even fMRI, is not great, and we need methods to really capture the sort of time series that occurs uh, over, over short periods of time. And so here is where we're going to start using uh, you know, neurophysiology, in particular EEG. Now, EEG, there's a range of different EEG technologies, going from the scalp EEG that many of us are familiar with to the uh, high-density arrays, which go from maybe 21 or 30 uh, electrodes all the way up to 256. So it provides a much, much finer um, degree of, of spatial resolution. And then even uh, we can place, of course, EEG probes either on the surface of the brain, uh, electrocorticography, or inside the brain, which is the depth of EEG probes. And so this is an example of you know, the increasing resolution that can be achieved, for example, with the high-density EEG arrays, which are available and many research groups are using, primarily in the cognitive neurosciences. And this is a, simply an illustration of the uh, invasive EEG methods such as ECOG or depth EEG probes, which we do quite a bit of actually at uh, Johns Hopkins. So when we talk about sources of data or big data in the neuro ICU, the principal ones are, of course, the phenotype and the data that we can get from the EHR. There's neuroimaging. We discussed that a little bit this morning. There's neurophysiology, and then, of course, there's uh, the multi-omics. So today we're going to be talking about EEG. And I'm just showing you here the workflow for content con for um, the, the conventional EEG, or I guess the standard EEG uh, workflow that occurs in hospitals across the world, right? So we're talking about essentially a process of acquiring data uh, and then doing a little bit of pre-processing. So we're usually using filters, we're removing artifacts, we're segmenting the data in time. Uh, and then we do, we give the data to an epileptologist uh, or we try to read it ourselves and we arrive at some kind of qualitative impression. Uh, the problem with this approach is that it's extremely inaccurate, right? So it can be spot on, but it can be inaccurate. If you get five epileptologists in the room reading the same EG, they never agree, and this has been published. Um, and so there's very, very low um, you know, classification accuracy and very low reliability. So the question is, can we do better? And what I'm showing you here on this slide is a, maybe a little bit of a more complicated workflow, but, ten, but potentially one which can really allow us to glean much more information from the EG. The EG is a very rich signal <clears throat> it's very high frequency and it contains a huge amount of information that we're not currently capturing or exploiting. So this diagram, um, this, this slide essentially illustrates two um, paradigms. So there's the conventional EEG, which is shown in red, and then there's the quantitative EEG, which we've heard a lot about. This has been developed very much in the past 20, 25 years, which is taking uh, the conventional approach a step further. Essentially, it's extracting features, extracting the, from the raw EEG signal features. So essentially, mathematically transforming the EEG signal using techniques like Fourier transforms or wavelet analysis or looking at things like you know, entropy or connectivity. So it's essentially trying to glean more uh, information or knowledge out of the, the EEG signal. But what I'd like to talk to you about today is going even a step further, which is to 
<clears throat> using those features that we've, um, that we've uh, extracted to try to distill those that are most important. So this is called feature selection. And this often requires a process uh, of machine learning called dimensionality reduction. It's a type of unsupervised machine learning where we use a technique like PCA uh, or clustering to try to identify those most salient features that we can use then in our final prediction model. So what are the uh, designs for EEG, the experimental designs? There's really three. One is the sort of so-called passive no stimulus paradigm. This is the resting EEG where you simply have the EEG array on. You do, there's no uh, uh, defined stimulus or task and you record uh, the signal um, at rest. Uh, and this can be used, of course, for detection, detecting seizures, detecting ischemia for prognostication. <clears throat> and then there's the passive stimulus paradigm. So this is, for example, um, reactivity testing, a defined you know, um, noxious stimulus or an auditory stimulus or, for example, a, um, you know, a, a, a tactile stimulus, recording the change in frequency or in amplitude that occurs in EG after. This um, also is the case, for example, for um, evoke potentials or for techniques like um, combining TMS with EEG. <clears throat> and this is primarily used for prognostication purposes in the clinical realm. And then perhaps most interestingly, and I'll show you a slide at the end which refers to this, uh, there's the active paradigms where if you have a patient, for example, who is you know, unconscious, you ask them to engage in a task uh, and you record the EEG signal. So before the paradigm, before the task, during the task, after the task. And it's, so it, it, in terms of the, the methodology, it's analogous to the fMRI task paradigm. And the idea is to detect things that may not be apparent, for example, in, uh, clinically or phenotypically. So this is uh, a technique that has been used to detect um, covert uh, consciousness in patients who appear unresponsive in, um, in the ICU. So the, I'm not going to belabor um, the discussion of different quantitative EEG features. They can be categorized in different ways. What I'm showing you here is the different uh, sort of broad domains of EEG features. There's the frequency domain features, there's the time domain features, and then there are the entropy uh, features, and there's many, many different um, examples of each. Um, and the real question is, what can we do with, you know, with these features, and especially by applying machine learning to these features? So I think there's three areas that we can really, really go into. One is detection, so detecting things like seizures, right? Automated seizure detection is one of the holy grails you know, in neurology. Um, so, uh, detecting things like ischemia. So for example, a patient is undergoing a carotid procedure or, or heart surgery. Can we, you know, um, can we identify signatures on the EEG that will tell us that there's ischemia? Um, detecting cognitive states. Another domain, of course, is prediction. Can we predict short-term physiological changes? Can we predict long-term outcomes? Can we predict, importantly, response to therapy? And then there's some emerging areas that are, of course, very, very interesting. So one of them is the sort of decision support. Can uh, the EEG be used to you know, supplement the thinking or decision-making of the clinician? Uh, can we use the EEG for brain-computer interfaces, in particular for severely brain-injured patients who have lost the capacity to execute? Uh, motor commands, you know, in a, a homogeneous way. So I just want to show you this slide which demonstrates this concept of EEG reactivity. Um, so it's basically, it's very simple, right? So you apply a defined stimulus. It can be noxious, it can be tactile, it can be auditory. It can be like a clap. It can be sectioning of the endotracheal tube. And then you um, analyze the changes or lack of changes in frequency and in, um, in amplitude or and or in amplitude. Um, and so this is done off usually qualitatively by the epileptologists. On the left, you have an example of um, a uh, painful stimulus, uh, and you can see that there's absolutely no change in the signal. So this, um, in a patient after cardiac arrest, this portends usually poor outcome. Uh, on the right, you have uh, very clear, uh, on the, the black on the top, if you, can re you can may, may not be able to read it, indicates that they clapped, uh, and you can see that there's a sudden decrease in the EG frequency suggesting reactivity. And in general, in patients with anoxic ischemic brain injury, this is a, a good sign. So the question, this is all very qualitative. It sounds cool, but is it really, can we turn this into something that's numerical and that we can measure? Uh, and this is a very nice paper, um, you know, from um, Edelberto uh, Armarim looking essentially at three different uh, stimulus paradigms and uh, analyzing the EEG reactivity and then take it going that step further and training a machine learning classifier to recognize the association between these reactivity changes and outcomes. And in fact, uh, they, they were quite good. So you can see here three different plots on the left. 
zero reactivity on the right of uh, you know, intermediate and in the middle of high reactivity. Uh, and there is a correlation between uh, the degree of reactivity and uh, the, uh, the outcomes as seen in this ROC plot. It's a very small sample size. These are preliminary data, but it's kind of exciting to see this. This is another uh, paper that was done, a couple of papers that were done, patients with uh, anoxic ischemic brain injury using continuous EG. And here uh, they uh, extracted these quantitative features uh, and uh, they ran them uh, through a machine. They trained a machine learning classifier to recognize the relationship between these features uh, and uh, the outcome of these post-cardiac arrest patients. And they were able to demonstrate actually that, um, or actually they generated a, an index called the cerebral recovery index, which actually performs reasonably well. Here you have some, uh, this is a revised version of the same index, but you have the uh, discrimination as uh, uh, demonstrated by the AUC, uh, which has a time dependence. You can see that at six hours, the AUC was um, about 92. Um, it peaks around 12 hours so, to 94%, and then at 24 hours, it starts going down again. So there is, interestingly, as far as EG is concerned, it appears that uh, the 24-hour EG might be the most discriminative of outcomes after cardiac arrest, at least according to these data. These are uh, data from an, a separate group based uh, primarily in Boston. And what they did was they extracted features, they, they, they ran um, the raw EEG data through a deep learning algorithm, and they wanted to find out whether uh, they compared a, a range of different um, you know, uh, classifiers to determine which one performed best and what was the time dependence of these different algorithms. And it, it turned out that actually the best performing alg algorithm was not the deep learning, but it was this uh, generalized linear model, which was time dependent. So time sensitive means that essentially it integrated not only the current EEG, but also all the accumulated EEG data that had uh, accrued over time prior to the, the, the point in time when the de determination was made. And so you can see here, um, actually the, the random forest here is the CRI, it's the Cerebral Recovery Index, which as, you, as I showed you earlier, declines, the uh, performance declines over time. On the other hand, the GLM uh, model, actually the performance increases in time, so that when you get to 72 hours of EG recording, uh, it's, uh, it's reached an AUC of almost uh, 80%. So this is very interesting. It shows that depending on the machine learning model that you use, you may get very, very different results in terms of discrimination between patients. And this is uh, another slide showing some very similar data. So this touches upon a question which is important, which is that um, you know, depending on the, the models, you also get different levels of, uh, of accuracy and performance. So for example, we know that neural networks, deep learning in general, the more data that you provide them, uh, the greater their, um, their discrimination capacity. On the other hand, uh, more conventional machine learning models such as support vector machine, they sort of reach a plateau. So you give them a lot of data, they improve initially, but then the more data you give them, they do not get any better. So, um, and this uh, ties in with this issue of performance and interpretability, right? So, uh, it, you know, in, in broadly speaking, uh, the high performing models like deep learning uh, perform the best but they're, they are opaque, they're not interpretable. It's very difficult to understand how they work. It's very difficult to discern the underlying features that drive the model. On the other hand, um, the more simpler models such as linear regression or decision trees are, perform much less uh, well. Their discrimination is much lower, but uh, they're more understandable. We can actually pick them apart <clears throat> and we can unpack them. We can, we can look at the individual factors or features that are driving the performance of those models. So just last, a couple of slides, uh, and I know that I'm, I think I started late, so bear with me. <laughs> um, we, one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning is can we leverage EEG, and especially machine learning applied to EEG, to detect covert consciousness in um, critically ill patients. This is a very nice study from the group in Columbia uh, that was published just a few months ago where they placed a conventional EEG, scalp EEG, on comatose patients in the ICU. Uh, and then they, these were all patients who were unresponsive, not able to phenotypically follow any, com any commands. And they asked them to imagine that they were opening and closing their hand, right? And then they recorded the EEG signal. Um, and um, they trained essentially a machine learning based on healthy controls who were doing the same. And so they trained the machine learning classifier to recognize the EEG signal that was associated with the healthy controls. And what they found was that in a subset of these unresponsive critically ill patients, about 15%, um, produced a EEG signature that was almost the same as the signature that was identified um, in uh, the healthy controls, suggesting that these individuals actually have maintained the ability to follow commands, even though 
you would not be able to recognize that by a clinical exam. And this is a very, very important finding that's been demonstrated by multiple groups using other techniques, such as fMRI. It demonstrates that our capacity to fully under understand our patients at the bedside using just the physical exam has some very, very major limitations. So uh, in terms of a take-home message, I hope I've been able to give you a sense that you know, quantitative features extracted from neurophysiology time series are signatures of underlying neural states, that we can decode this neurophysiology, um, but it requires a principled approach, integrating, integrating a biological model and appropriate signal processing. And that when we apply you know, uh, to, applied to high dimensional neurophysiological data, statistical and machine learning methods can really increase uh, the accuracy of classification when compared to uh, conventional statistical methods. I do need to acknowledge uh, a lot of collaborators, uh, funding support from the NIH, uh, European Union, and from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Thank you very much. So I know that it is time for us to uh, finish this session, but I did want to leave some time uh, for one or two questions for the last two speakers. Yes, sir. Thank you. Al Alan Morris, Salt Lake City. I have a question uh, for Dr. Stevens and, and others. Uh, I noted with interest your comment that five different epileptologists make five different interpretations when you're trying to validate the data. Uh, you could take epileptology out, just leave it blank, and we could add any clinical discipline and virtually come up with the same answer. How do you deal with that when you're depending so much on interpretation by uh, human domain experts? So I, I think if we stay in the, in the discussion around machine learning, artificial intelligence, I, I would like to refer back to something that was brought up by Dr. Park, which is of huge importance, which really, I think, undergirds the success of any machine learning um, uh, project or experiment. And it's the uh, identifying really robust ground truth labels, right? So what do we mean by ground truth or, or labels? We mean essentially those are the things that we're going to be using to train the classifier to make this association between features and, 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 and predict a, a probability of, of an outcome occurring. And so I think the weaknesses of many of the models that are being published is that the ground truth was maybe questionable based on things like, for example, an epileptologist read or someone's definition of sepsis using whatever uh, you know, criteria. And I think it, it's, so what is the, perhaps the most robust ground truth label? It's th things like survival, you know, mortality. There's really no discussing, no argument about that. In the realm of neurocritical care, there's another one, which is, for example, the occurrence of a stroke as detected on, M on an MRI, right? The MRI in general doesn't lie if you have uh, if you obtain, you know, a week after a stroke, an MRI, you will see a flare hyperintense signal uh, in a vascular distribution. That is a stroke. You can't argue with that. That's ground truth. So I think one of the things that's really important is for people who are doing this kind of research is to really, really be very careful about their labels. I don't know if you. I would actually add to that and really push back on one thing you said. Um, not the part where you said I said something important. That was great. Um, but uh, the, with radiology, I think that is um, a reason why we're seeing so many radiology applications really coming to fruition early is because it's one of the more cleaner um, ground truths, right? Um, but in terms of, like, stroke, you can see it radiologically, but if you're looking for mortality, um, we have learned in our industry that uh, we have this wonderful thing called the ICH score, which was made in the early 2000s to predict uh, mortality after ICH. Well, 10 years later, they, they didn't quite do a retraction, but they apologized, saying it turns out that the number one reason for death was withdrawal of care. And so if you're using <laughs> some of these features that are going into your you know, logistic regression, whatever, the baseline um, scale that says patient's going to die, that's exactly what you're thinking as a clinician. You're withdrawing hair, the patient's going to die. And so um, it's really important, again, not only to look at uh, ground truths, but also to think about what are the biases that are being introduced by your structural inequalities or culture, for example. I had no other commentary. <laughs> I think it was covered pretty well. Uh, did you have another question, sir? Well, no, I just point out that the ground truth sounds uh, sounds very helpful, even biblical. But you know, <laughs> philosophically, there are two sources of truth, which is basically based on agreement among humans. Uh, 
One is based on belief of humans. That's five epileptologists all telling you what they think the world is about. And the other is based on validity, the way the world works. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems I see with this domain is that the retrospective back-end review of data trying to produce rules that might be applicable at the front end and decision making is, uh, uh, I, I don't mean to sound critical, but is flawed. Uh, and uh, without front end rules to enable clinicians to make replicable decisions, the database itself is laced with the kind of bias that you're wrestling with. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about the front end, back end challenge and, and, and in fact the basis of AI. In, in the 1950s at the Dartmouth meeting, AI was established as a domain by 10 people because they were doing production rule systems, rule based systems, mm -hmm. front end systems. Can I speak? Sure. I've given this a lot of thought, obviously, because, you know, if you um, are, you're only predicting as good as you've performed, right, in the past. And so um, the way I think about implementation, hopefully in the future for critical care in neurology or neurocritical care is, um, is more of like a standardization or quality improvement. So there, when we have five different epileptologists that disagree, we still have to make a decision at the bedside when we're looking at a continuous EEG. I was talking with somebody in the audience before about this specific situation. We tend to overread because what is safe for the patient? It's better to be wrong but false positive wrong that we think the patient's seizing and treat if they're in status, for example, than to undertreat. And so. Um, what is a safe false positive for a, not a precise prediction or detection model? I think when you're implementing something or just creating clinical decision support, that is my goal, is I'm trying a, to do the best you can. I'm sorry, but we're about six minutes over time, so unfortunately I won't be able to take any further questions. I apologize. But thank you very much, everyone. Good.